Uh, welcome to our online uh, service for St Augustine's Anglican Church here in Inverell in uh, North West New South Wales. My name's Adam Draycott and it's great to be sharing God's word with you today. Uh, this is the uh, 20, 34th Ordinary Sunday, uh, the 22nd of November and our sentence of scripture comes from the book of Revelation chapter 5 verse 12 magnificent words it says worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing to him be glory and dominion forever and ever amen let's bow our heads and pray almighty and merciful god you break the power of evil and make all things new in your Son, Jesus Christ, the King of the universe. May all in heaven and earth acclaim your glory and never cease to praise you. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Come to the ministry of God's word. Our Bible readings come from Isaiah 59 verses 1 to 9 and then 15b to verse 20, Psalm 14. Now please take a moment to pause the screen and read through those passages of scripture. Our preaching passage comes from Romans chapter 3. Uh, beginning at verse 9. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. As it is written, there is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. 
There is no one who seeks God. All have turned away. They have together become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Their throats are open graves. Their tongues practice deceit. The poison of vipers is on their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. And the way of peace they do not know. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. Uh, let us pray. Uh, Father God, we thank you that we can uh, share your word together. Uh, we ask for your help that uh, you might show us the glory and wonder uh, and our great need that is your son, Jesus. Uh, lead us in the way of repentance and faith, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, well, as I've said before, I grew up in uh, the western suburbs of Sydney and I went to a high school called Shalvey High. And it had its own reputation. And well, you know, during my time there, I, f I found myself in Parramatta Court with a whole bunch of my mates. And why were we there? Well, we were told to go to the court to hear the case, and it involved shoplifting. Uh, and we were only in year nine at the time. And I don't know what you're thinking right now, but just to reassure you, it was just a school excursion, okay, for legal studies. Um, anyway, in the courthouse, a middle-aged woman was accused of shoplifting from uh, Kmart. And we were all gripped by the proceedings. Witnesses, friends, accusers spoke. And then the accused took the stand. And as she spoke, suddenly all of the Year 9 Legal Studies class gasped. <gasps> and she said some more and we gasped again. And then she seemed to panic as she dug herself into a hole with her words, and then she became silent. Of course, the judge frowned and eyeballed us, the defence team glared at us, the judge spoke and told us to be silent, the accused was silent. Man, everybody in that courtroom uh, was quiet at that point. Uh, every mouth was silenced. And if you understand this passage, uh, it will do exactly that. You'll find yourself in the witness box of a courtroom and the scriptures will charge us with sin and every mouth will be silenced. There'll be no contest. Which brings us to chapter 3, verse 9. Let's look at it. What shall we conclude then? Do we have any advantage? Not at all, for we have already made the charge that Jews and Gentiles alike are all under the power of sin. Is sin where we slip up from time to time or struggle occasionally? Uh, it's way more than that. It means that humanity is under the power of sin. It's part of our nature. We're ruled by it. We're characterised by it. Maybe you're of the popular view that humanity is basically good. You know, the cliche, how does that go? Uh, there's a little bit of good in everybody. The Bible is not interested in popular cliches. From verse, uh, the God's word tells us that by nature, humanity is sinful. By nature, our relationship with God is not a right one, but a wrong one. And so what follows here in this passage is like a snapshot from verses 10 to 18. You can look at it there and you wonder, is it a song? Is it a poem? Whatever it is, it's uh, a lyric that portrays sin. Uh, there's a long list of Old Testament quotes here. They're all jammed together. So Psalm 14 is there, Psalm 5, Isaiah 59 it comes in at the end, as well as some others, all packed together to give you a picture. But I want you to see how the picture starts. Look at verse 10. There's no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who understands. There is no one who seeks God. That's how it begins universal problem and how does this how do these lyrics end look at verse 18 it's the same way there's no one who fears god 
And so it, it serves like bookends. From beginning to end, from start to finish, God is rejected. And what is in between? Well, that should grab us. What, what's in between? What is it like when God is rejected? Verse 13, their throats are open graves, their tongues are deceitful, their lips are poisonous, their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Verse 14, uh, what, what body part are we here? Is here? It's, it's, the, it's the throat, the tongue, the lips, it's the mouth. It's interesting, what does Jesus say about the mouth? He says, from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. It's diagnostic, isn't it? Our mouths show us who we are and what we are like. I don't know about you, but did you ever get your mouth washed out with soap as a kid by your mum? I sure did, and she didn't miss. But what, what is being spoken here is yuck. Poisonous words from poisonous people and their fundamental flaw is their rejection of God. Look at verses 15. We move from the mouth to what? Verse 15. Their feet are swift to flesh, are shed blood. Ruin and misery mark their ways. Peace they do not know. So violent words are now matched by violent actions. From the swift feet that run to violence all the way to the head that speaks of cursing and bitterness. Can you see this is a problem from top down, down to the feet, from top to toe. This is the embodied experience of sin, I think. See, we could ask, why is the world like the world is? You can turn on our news. Is this our world or is it our country? Is it our home? Fractured, fighting, faulty, fearful, groaning, without peace. There is no fear of God in their eyes. And can we see that all that is wrong with our world starts and ends with our response to God? See, what is wrong with the world? We are. And we have ignored God. And our relationship with him is not right. We're all under the power of sin. Now, when we come to verse 19, that mouth stuff is there again. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced, see it? And the whole world held accountable to God. Uh, Paul is back talking about the law. What is the law? Think Ten Commandments, if that helps. Old covenant stuff. And as I just read in verse 19, whatever the law says, it says to those under the law, okay, the Jews, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world accountable to God. Now, how does that work? If the law is given to the Jews, how then am I and the rest of the world accountable? Well, let's, let's talk about this. The Jewish nation Israel had enormous privilege. They were entrusted with the words of God, verse 2. God spoke to them. God gave them commandments, law, that put their relationship with God into a framework. Huh? What do I mean? I mean, the law really just spells out what Israel already knew. And in practice, they already knew what was right and what was wrong, like the rest of humanity. But the law, it takes what they already knew and did and it frames it in terms of a relationship with a God that they do know. And Israel says, yes, we're up for that. And that's the covenant. And if you asked a rabbi what the heart of the law, what the heart of this relationship is, they would say the law. But the heart of the law is what? The heart of the law is a love for God. With all your heart, strength and soul. That's, that's Deuteronomy 6. That's, that's what Moses has written there. In fact, it's so important you impress it on your children to love God and everything else flows out of that. And because they love God, they are more than capable of doing this stuff. But they didn't. No one did. They've turned their backs on God. They've done the relational thing of putting a wall up, which means they're unrighteous. They've turned their backs on God, which leads to the next question. 
If people who had a history of knowing God failed, then what hope does anyone have? That's the right question. In chapter 3, verse 2, we're told that they had every kind of advantage. Every kind of advantage. It's like teaching a child to ride a bike. To keep the balance of the bike right, you steer and you push the pedals and you keep momentum as you push forward. Uh, don't get lessons from the Reverend Paul Foster, though. He's, we were pastors together in Gunnada. He's now in Corindai. And he would ride around Gunnada on his fancy Italian bike. It was so fancy, he'd park it in his study. And he had all the gear, he had proper clip-in shoes and the fancy lycra and the whole box and dice. And what does the Reverend Paul Foster go and do? Well, his first mistake was to fall off his bike and he scrapes his knee. His second mistake was, well, he told me about it. Why am I telling you this story? Because it goes to show that all those years of practice... All those years of being blessed with the right stuff, the right equipment, the right instruction could not save Paul Foster from falling over and scraping his knee. Which goes to show that you can give or entrust a kid with every kind of advantage. You can give them instructions, you can bless them with the right stuff and they will still fail. And if that is true, what hope does anyone else have who has not been instructed or blessed? So do you see it? One chosen people out of all humanity, every chance, every benefit, every blessing. Do we honestly think we could have done better? Is this like when sometimes you hear people going, oh, Adam and Eve, if they only they hadn't, not realising that what Adam and, did, Adam and Eve did is what we do every day. So then we are all silenced in the witness box. There's no contest. There's no response. There's no excuse because all of us are under the power of sin and it leaves us speechless. So what does the law do? Verse 20, stay with me. No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by observing law. See, there's, there's nothing you can do to earn God's favour. Keeping the Ten Commandments is not a way, a means of averting God's wrath. It's not how we're saved. Verse 20, rather through the law we become conscious of sin. So we see the law does two things. First thing, J.B. Phillips says, the straight edge of the law shows us how crooked we are. It makes us silent, there's no contest, there's no excuse. Second thing the law does is that it arouses sin. See, if I said uh, no one is to look at the bottom right corner of the screen right now, well, now that's all you want to do. That's all you want to do is look at the bottom right-hand corner of the screen. It's ridiculous. You've been asked not to, but now you want to. That's, that's just how sin works. And so that's the law. It shows us not what is right with us, but what is not right with us. Okay, so why do we need the bad news, Adam? Adam? Because you can't know and understand the good news. You can't know it's such good news unless you grapple with the bad news. And so the law is held up like a mirror. And we look in the mirror and it renders us silent because first base in being saved is recognising our need, that we need saving. And so we are here. We stand in the witness box with nothing to offer as an excuse. We're struck dumb and imprisoned by our sin, we are silenced. This is where we pause and take a deep breath. Our passage moves us this morning from mouthy wicked people in verses 10 to 18 to silence in verse 19. It's a silence that's not unfamiliar in the Old Testament where it's strongly connected to God's judgment. Zephaniah 1 verse 7 says, Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day the Lord is near. The final judgment is so awful that the whole world falls utterly silent in God's presence. That, that's, that's Romans chapter 3 verse 20, isn't it? That, that's where we are now. In, in fact, if we think about it, if we remember 
uh, will know that there's silence also in the book of Revelation. In chapter 8, there's silence before God and his throne, silence for about half an hour. And then in chapter 8, the prayers of God's people are offered up and they rise with the incense and then after that, boom, judgment. And at this point, we must ask, and where is Jesus in all this? Well, what did our sentence of scripture say? In Revelation chapter 5, verse 12, it says, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom. To him be glory. There he is on the throne, a Lamb who is slain. And how did Isaiah six to eight hundred years prior, described the slain lamb? Well, let me jog your memory. Isaiah puts it like this. We all like sheep have gone astray. That's Romans 3. Each of us has turned to our own way. That's Romans 3. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, and yet he did not open his mouth he was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before its shearers is silent so he did not open his mouth he was assigned a grave with the wicked verse 9 and with the rich in his death though he had done no violence nor was any deceit in his mouth why didn't the lamb open his mouth? <laughs> we can't and we shouldn't, but he could have at any time. The truly innocent one. I mean, the truly innocent one, you won't find him in Romans chapter 3. He's the complete opposite. And he'll suffer the consequences of all that we read here. The innocent one, the one who could have used words to defend himself, the one that could have called down the angels and put an end to all of it, but he doesn't. He doesn't call out. He does not open his mouth. Why? Because the cross of Christ is the judgment of God and the silence is fitting if one is guilty. And the Lamb of God, we're told in Isaiah, wears our guilt. He willingly subjects himself to all that was coming to us. The Lord laid on him the iniquity of us all. God's wrath and judgment that was ours is laid on him. He's silent as he obeys the Father. Silent as he loves a rebellious, wicked world. Silent as he loves you and as he loves me. Willingly. Have you been silenced today? And in your silence now, can you see Jesus loving you deeply? Does his silence before the judgment of God speak volumes? Does it shout loudly about his love? His love for his father and his love for you. A love for a world that is broken and that rejected him. And after our silence, doesn't this move us? Uh, to never-ending praise for the Lamb as we join with the saints. Doesn't it move us to, to, to words of great joy and thanksgiving that for all that God has done for us in Christ Jesus? Amen. And we come now to a time of confession. Uh, we read in Acts chapter 17, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. For he has set a day when he will judge the world with justice by the man he has appointed. And from 1 John, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, 
He is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Well, that being the case, I invite you now, uh, please, to confess our sins to Almighty God together. Most merciful God, we humbly admit that we need your help. We confess that we have wandered from your way, we have done wrong, and we have failed to do what is right. You alone can save us. Have mercy on us, wipe out our sins, and teach us to forgive others. Bring forth in us the fruit of the Spirit, that we may live as disciples of Christ. This we ask in the name of Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Well, God wills that all people should be saved, and in response to his call, we acknowledge our sins. So he pardons those of us who humbly repent and as we truly believe the gospel. And therefore, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, to whom be blessing and honour forever. And we can be encouraged with these great words from 1 John chapter 2. If anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Will you please join me as we pray the prayer of general thanksgiving. Most merciful Father, we humbly thank you for all your gifts so freely given to us, for life and health and safety, for power to work and leisure to rest. We praise and glorify your holy name. But above all, we thank you for your spiritual mercies in Christ Jesus our Lord, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let me now close with these uh, words of blessing and encouragement from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal encouragement and good hope, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good deed and word. Amen. Um.